Good morning, St. Andrews. We are so excited that you've joined us for worship this morning. And if you have friends or family that you wish to invite to worship, click the invite button that is there in the chat screen and extend that invitation. We know a lot of you are going through some very tough times right now, and we want to be praying for you. If you have a prayer request, you can share it with us also in the chat screen or fill out the form on saumc.life after the service. Before you fill your Connect card out this morning, we have a quick reminder. Please use only one name in the first and last name fields. There is a spot on the form to add additional household members. And make sure you're using your current email address. For your email address, it was, is what links the Connect card to your unique account in our computer system. You can fill out your Connect card by clicking the button in the chat screen now. And even though our campus is closed, there's still a lot going on in the life of the church. Sign up so that you receive the Friday Connection or visit us at saumc.life to get plugged in. Now I invite you to join with me in preparing your heart for a great day of worship together. time when I'm able to say to you, look around and smile at the people around you, but right now the choir can do that. You can greet each other by smiling and looking around at each other. We can't out in the congregation just yet. Just Bob's out there. Hey, Bob. Um, what you need to do, though, is to think of some people. There's got to be someone who has a need right now. There are lots of lots of people in need right now, and you might have a good friend or acquaintance or someone who would love to hear from you. So jot that name down or right now take your phone and uh, give them a text or send them an email and just let them know that you're thinking about them. Thank you. Good morning. I am uh, Pastor Jane Rideout. I am one of the co-lead pastors here at the church and I'm happy to be in worship with you this morning. We're going to begin with our um, scripture lesson, and I'm reading to you out of the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, um, several verses between 16 and 23. I don't stop giving thanks to God for you when I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call, God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at God's right side in the heavens. 
far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named not only now but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church, which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Well, have you ever um, seen those commercials for those Ancestry.com? Um, I guess it's a very common thing these days for people to find out about what their DNA is. They want to know about their ancestry. They want to know about their families, more history than maybe what they had heard. Or maybe they want to confirm something they've always suspected. And so it's a very popular thing. And um, I have heard there's a few complaints with it, but I think basically those companies do a good job. Um, there's lots of them. It's not just ancestry. Dot com, but there's other ones that do that. And I did some reading about it, and I'm just kind of curious. So your question for the chat room this morning is, have you done that? Have you had your DNA tested? And if you did, um, are you happy with the results, or do you w- wish you hadn't done it, or you say it was a waste of money? But I'd be just curious, have you done that? So go ahead and put in your chat if that's something you've done or you want to do, or maybe you're going to give it to someone to, as a gift for this Christmas. So I'm um, just curious about that. I bring that up because I think that often um, we want more information on our identity. We want to know who we are. We, w- we want to know where we come from. We want to know our history because it kind of shapes us and forms us. Often we're, we're not sure who we are, and so we need to hear those things, and that kind of gives us a little peace in having some understanding. And that's really what our scripture reading, reading today was all about. It was about... Um, our identity in Jesus Christ. You see, you have your identity that comes through um, your, your biological parents or your, the, the people who birthed you, but you also have an identity, a spiritual identity. And, and it comes from being a follower of Jesus Christ. And so our scripture was kind of talking about it. And it's a great scripture, but the theologians say that when you read it, it's almost like the author, um, some would say Paul, piled the words all together when he wrote to, the, um, to, to this, this book of Ephesians that he was really excited. It was kind of like someone running up to you and they're really excited about something and they talk really fast and you know they're excited by the way they're saying it and the way they're talking, but you're not really sure what they just said. And so you're, when they get all done, you're like, all right, slow down. What? I'm not sure what you say. I know it's something good, but I'm not positive. So that's kind of what this, this scripture is. It's kind of jam-packed full of stuff, and so I want to unpack it a little bit for you. We're going to actually read it again, and this time I'll give you a little context to it as we read the scripture, because it's really important to understand the before and the after and what the author is trying to communicate to us. So let's just begin with that very first line that says, I don't stop giving thanks to God for you when I remember you in my prayers. Now here's something you should know about the book of Ephesians. Um, Back then, when you read most books um, that name a city, it meant the letter was written to the home churches in that city. Like the book of Romans was written to the home churches in Rome. And they didn't have big meeting places like this. They met in homes, and those letters would be circulated around. Well, this particular letter doesn't mean it just went to Ephesus. In fact, the, the, this, this letter of Ephes- to the Ephesians is really a letter to a lot of regions and a lot of areas. This was called a circular letter. And it went to a lot of different people, and the message of it was so important. So a lot of people were hearing it. But the interesting part is that this, those home churches probably didn't know the author. They had never probably met the author of this letter. Now let's go back, and it says... I don't stop giving thanks to God for you when I remember you in my prayers. So they're being prayed for by someone they do not know. But what this letter is acknowledging is this intimate relationship, not because they know each other, because they eat Sunday dinner together, because they hang out on the weekends. It's because they're both, because they're all followers of Jesus Christ. They share a DNA. They share this relationship. And so this stranger is praying for them. The stranger is caring for them and writing them letters and instructing them. So that's part of this letter, this love letter of people who share a a spiritual DNA. The next line is, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. 
or I think when I heard spirit of wisdom and revelation, I don't know about you, but I am in deep need of wisdom in my life. I mean, I cannot tell you that there isn't an area that I don't need wisdom. I need wisdom in relationship with, with how to be, how to raise kids, kids who are now actually almost adults, um, how to um, be in relationship with other people, how to be a pastor during COVID when we're separated by so much. And, and I need wisdom every day. And if you need wisdom, hear this. In this are words of wisdom for us, that there's, there's hope for us to have this wisdom. The next verse is, I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call. The hope of God's call. Well, I, I think it's this reminder that we all have a calling. And, and sometimes we think just the preachers or the teachers or the choir members, they have a clear calling. But actually, every believer has a calling and we should have hope in that calling. The hope is, is that God's got a call for us. He's got something he wants us to do. That he's already gifted us and prepared us to do something. So there's hope to be found in that. And we need hope. We're lacking hope right now with, with so many things um, that are different in this season. It is really hard to be hopeful. But the hope is in our calling, that our calling hasn't changed because there's a pandemic. God is calling us to do something. It may look different now, but we need to find what the different is because we're still called nonetheless. Verse 20 said, God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at the right hand side of the heavens. So this is a reference, and you probably can figure this out. It's, it's talking about Jesus' death and resurrection really the most important moment in all of history. Um, it's not the day Jesus was born. I love that we celebrate the birth of Jesus, but that isn't the most important moment in the time. God crashing into this earth in the form of a baby, that's not the most significant time. What's the most significant is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ because in that moment, everything changed. Everything that had happened thousands of years before and everything that has happened since and will continue to happen into the future, Everything changed because of that one moment in that space and time. That one moment changed it all for us. And sometimes we don't even think about the resurrection of Jesus till Easter. And that's in combination with Easter bunnies. My goodness, it's the most important time. And so this is reminding us of our history, that we are followers of Christ because of that moment in our history. It is part of our DNA. It's a part of our story. It's a part of who we are. Because of that moment, Everything is different for us. And then the very end. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church, which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. That's a mouthful, but it basically is talking about you and me. It's basically talking about us who make up the church so basically what God said is through this work he has done, Christ has become the head of the church. He is the head, and we're the body. And the head needs the body to be the hands and feet. And when you think about it, that is absolutely nuts. I mean, a lot of people all will say, oh, I don't go to church because I love Jesus, I love God, but I don't like the institution of the church. It's a bureaucracy. The church has done a lot of damage. And you know what? Frankly, that's true. But here's the truth, is that God, who's the one who said, Jesus is the head and the church is the body. So God in his wisdom has looked down on us and said, gosh, those are an imperfect people. Those are people that mess up and make bad decisions and often aren't kind, yet I'm going to use them. And they're going to be the hands and feet. And I'm going to spread the kingdom of God in amazing ways. But I'm going to use the church. So folks, if you're listening, you're like, oh, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. Guess what? That was God's plan. It wasn't the church's plan. It was God's plan. Because the church together can do so much more in the world. And yes, it's imperfect. But all of us are. It's only because of the grace of Jesus Christ that we do amazing things. And so this is a reminder of our, of our DNA, of, of who we are, where we come from, why we do what we do, why we claim who we are. We're, we're children of God. Now, some of you are probably saying, so what the heck does this have to do with the sermon series we've been in? For the last five weeks, we've been doing a sermon series called the Lord's Prayer. 
And each week we would cover two phrases from the Lord's Prayer. And our goal in this sermon series was to really understand this prayer that we pray every week. Um, we've been praying it our whole lives, and after a while we may not even think about what it, what it means. And so we've been talking about and seeing that when Jesus taught us this prayer, he intentionally was giving us a lot of good theology. He was teaching us about who we are, what our identity is. He was literally saying, you are the people of God, and this is how you pray. And he's saying a whole lot. And so we have, re, we have been looking at it week by week. And, and this week we're going to actually look at the, the very last phrase, which is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And... You know, I don't know if I've ever thought about it much. To me, when we get there, I know we're wrapping up. It's the wrap-up phrase, right? We're almost to amen. But if you really pause and think about it, this kind of points us back at the scripture I just read because the scripture's talking about in the moment of Jesus' death and resurrection, God put all power and authority under his feet. All power and authority. So Jesus basically defines to us what power and authority is. He is the very definition of power and authority. Now think about that. How do you define power and authority? When you hear kingdom power and authority, what, where does your brain go? Um, if you're like most people, we have a very different view of power and authority. Most of us think about the people who have power and authority are people who are wealthy, people who have influence, um, people who can do what they want to do, people who maybe run companies or or maybe you're a great athlete or a great musician. Um, nowadays, it could be just a social media influencer or a great blogger. But when you have power and authority, a lot of people know about you and people talk about you and, and people mimic you and they dress the way you dress and they, they um, retweet what you re um, tweet. They, they, they care about you and they, they know about your life. And you usually, you know, you have power and you have influence and you, you can live the kind of life you want to live. And it's a really cool place to be, to have power and authority. It's a good thing. And most of us think, oh, man, I'd like to have a little power and authority. But when we pray um, kingdom, power, and authority, that is so not what we're talking about. You see, Jesus defines kingdom, power, and authority for us through his life. And what we learn through Jesus, when we say those words, it looks really different. Power and authority isn't about influence and, and money and all power. It's about quietly doing the right thing. Forgiving someone who has wronged you, even if nobody knows. Um, feeding the poor, which shoot, maybe no one notices that you feed the poor. Or maybe it's clothing the naked. It's, it's doing the right thing and loving the world around you and being in service. And nobody's applauding for you. Nobody's posting about you. No one's saying how great you are. No one's giving you lots of money to do that. But instead, you're changing lives and your own heart is being transformed. And people around you are being changed in ways you don't know. Except this time, God gets all the glory. God gets all the praise. Because you do it by only the power of the Holy Spirit that helps you do those things and you know it. It's such a different kind of power and glory. It's, it's, it's holy and it's quiet and it's often invisible. But man, when you experience it, it changes you. And it changes everyone around you. I remember hearing the story about a preacher who was working in a homeless shelter. And in this homeless shelter, he would go, and it was just for men, and he would go spend time and help feed and, you know, just kind of work there in general. And, and one night he was there, and this one of the men came in. He was homeless, and he was, in addition to being homeless, he had some mental illness. And so he was really stinky, and he wasn't taking advantage of the showers that the shelter was offering. You know, homeless people can't help often that they smell because they don't have access to showers. And this facility had showers. But this man didn't utilize that. And he came into the room and he sat down and he took his shoes off because his feet hurt. And everybody in the room just groaned. He had the smelliest feet. And everybody was just like, oh, you've got to be kidding. And then people started saying to him, put your shoes on. What's wrong with you, dude? Put your shoes on. But this man, as I said, he was mentally ill, and he didn't know how to respond in the right way, and his feet hurt. 
And he just sat there, and everybody was complaining, and everybody was offended, and he was just ruining the whole room. And then all of a sudden, out of the kitchen comes one of the workers, and he's got this big bucket of soapy hot water. And without saying a word, without saying anything to anybody around, he goes straight to that man, and he gets down on his knees, and he helps that guy take off his socks, and he puts his feet into that warm, soapy water, not saying a word. And the, the man who was ill didn't fight him for some reason. He just put his feet in there, and it could be his feet really hurt, and he was relieved to have his feet feel comforted by the water, and he put his feet in the water, and the pastor said the whole room went silent. He says, everybody stopped talking. And it was like a holy moment. I mean, everything changed. And the pastor said he never forgot that. And here's the weird thing. I just read about that so many years ago, but I've never forgot that story. Because it defines what holy is, and it defines what power and glory is. No one's going to cheer for you. No one is going to pay you money. But it's going to change everything, and you're going to know you were used of God. That's how we define power, glory. The kingdom of God looks really different than what the world is offering. But in so many ways, it's just so much more fulfilling. The last phrase of the Lord's Prayer is amen. It's just a word, actually. And you may know what it means. We've been saying amen at the end of our prayers forever. Some say amen. Some say amen. It doesn't really matter how you say it. It's more your tradition. But it basically means, from the Hebrews, so be it or right on. So basically what it means, those don't help us, is this is true. So when you say amen at the end of a prayer, you're saying this is true. Now, I've never heard it explained that way, and that just totally tickled me because um, in this day and age, that is such an unusual thing for us all at the end of a prayer to say, this is true. It's like we're all agreeing in the same space, this is true. Do you know how crazy that is in this day and age? Like nobody agrees on anything lately. There's no such thing as truth anymore. Um, you, when, you, when you talk about facts, there's facts and then there's fake facts. There's news and then there's fake news. We don't agree on anything, and so we all try to just find the news that we agree with and watch that. But we don't trust anything. Nobody trusts anything. And so we're in this really weird space that we all get together and we say this prayer, and at the end of the prayer we say, this is true. And think about it. We as a church, as, as, as people, we all have different politics, and we all probably look at our faith differently, and we probably even practice our faith, and I am sure we interpret Scripture differently, but we all together in agreement with one voice say, this is true. That the prayer that Jesus taught us is true. That we believe what we just said, yes, this is true. That is kind of amazing and kind of wonderful at the same time. When we're all done, we are all in agreement. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It unifies us. It's because we are one body. We are one heart. We're one mind. We're one spirit. This is true. So over the last five weeks, as I said, we've broken down the Lord's Prayer. And if you're like me, you don't remember what we prayed the last four. Because I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. So it's Really, let's, I'm going to do a quick review. Don't panic. I'll make this short and sweet. But we're going to just kind of quickly go over the whole prayer again. And then we're going to say it together. We're going to practice our faith. So I want us to, to, to look at the prayer. And I'm just going to kind of go line by line. And we're just going to say a quick reminder of what it means. And that way, if you missed a couple weeks, you'll kind of know what we preached at. So this is the short version. Our Father. Um, that is this reminder that we are in intimate relationship with God, that it is not um, this God who's at a distance, but it's intimate. It also reminds us that it's our collective Father. That is not a private prayer. This is a corporate prayer we pray together because we all share this Father. He loves all of us equally. And because of Jesus Christ, we even can be called his friend that we can even become so intimate that we're friends with him because of the work of Jesus Christ. And most importantly, I would say, is that he chose us. You know, sometimes we don't feel chosen by our Father. 
Sometimes our father doesn't always feel like they may always like us or love us. But it doesn't matter because our heavenly father chose us. It's not because we chose him. He chose us first. Our father, it's intimate, it's personal. Who art in heaven. Why does it matter that we know where um, God lives, where Jesus is up at this point? It's because it reminds us of the power and majesty of God. It's the power and majesty of Jesus, who is a cosmic God, who can solve cause cosmic problems. You know, we have a pandemic that's all over the world, and there are no viable answers, but we believe that this cosmic God can inspire women and men to find a vaccine, to bring healing to a world that is in desperate need of it. We believe that because he's a cosmic God. He's a big God who can do big things. We are never without hope because he is a big cosmic God. And then we pray, hallowed be your name. Basically what that is is praising God. And we praise God just to compel us to think about God because I don't know about you, but it's easy to go a couple days and say, whoa, I've been so busy. I'm not even talking to God. I'm not thinking about God. I come to church. I'm like, shoot, I went a whole week and didn't pray to God. This hallowed be thy name is this praise to God which compels us to put our focus on God, to remember him, to remember all the wonderful things he's done, to thank him for those wonderful things, to be in, in hearts of gratitude for what he's done, to praise him when he answers our prayers. Your kingdom come. Um, wrote down the, 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 the phrase that was in Gary's sermon, your kingdom come, you know, we can't say your kingdom come until you, we let our kingdom go. This is a thing of sort of wills. Which power and glory are you going to pursue? Are you going to the, pursue the power and glory that the, the, the world offers? I mean, it's okay to dream about being successful and even recognition. That's okay. But it's really important that remember that as the people of God, we are seeking the, the, the type of power and glory that changes hearts and minds, that changes the world in which we live. That's the kind we need to pursue. So it's not really about our kingdom or the kingdom the world offers us. It's about God's kingdom. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the really hard one when you say, okay, God, this is my prayer, and this is really how I think you should fix it. And you hold on to that for a while, and then eventually you say, okay, I'll let that go. You fix it the way you want to fix it. You solve it the way you want to solve it. You answer this prayer the way you want to answer it. I will let my answer go. Even though I'm pretty sure that I have the best answer for me, I understand that that's foolishness, that God has the best answer, and so I have to release him to do it his way. Give us today our daily bread. If you have a freezer full of bread, this is not about what you eat. It is about daily contact conversations with God to depend on him for everything. If you don't have enough to eat, he is your source and he will provide. But it's so much more than that. It's about going to him for everything. There are no small prayers. Taking everything to him. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Man, God is asking so largely of us. He is saying, yeah, you have to forgive people. You have to forgive them over and over. And that is so hard, and you can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have it in us because people are hard, and you have to forgive over and over. That is just reality. But you can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you also have to remember you have to receive forgiveness you got to forgive yourself. We all mess up. And I don't really care how bad your mess up is. God doesn't keep score. He just forgives us when we come to him and confess our sins. We have to come to him. But then we have to forgive ourselves. And we got to accept the forgiveness that he so freely offers us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There is evil all around us. It is there, but you do not have to fear it. God gives us the armor to battle it. God takes care of us. God has our back. Evil may be around us, but God is greater. Remember, he's that cosmic God. You don't have to fear it. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. If you're going to do kingdom God's way, it will be risky, but it will be magnificent. It will feel uncomfortable, 
but the fruit of what you do will pay off. It will be scary and awkward. But man, oh man, you will never regret practicing the power and glory that belongs to Jesus Christ because it will change your heart and everyone around you. And we say this because it is true. We say amen because it is true. And so now I'd like us to end this sermon with a prayer. And at the end of the prayer, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. And if you don't know the Lord's Prayer, um, they're going to put it up on the screen for you. And I want you to really think about what this prayer means because this is our identity. This is our DNA. We, all we really need is our spiritual identity. Our, our, our human identity may fail us. Some of us have histories that need to sort of stop right where they're at and, and your course needs to change. Our DNA is grounded in Jesus Christ and it is the best DNA. And our history is rich and full of the faithfulness of God. And when we pray this, remember, we are his people. And this is what we pray. Because we are going out into the world. We are his people. And he's with us. So let's bow our heads. Loving God, we are so grateful that you understood us enough to know we need to know how to pray. And we thank you that Jesus taught us how to pray, how to be in relationship with you, how to live godly lives, what it means to be the body of Jesus Christ, what it means to serve Jesus as the head of the church. We are so grateful that you taught us these things. And now by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you'll teach us how to live into them. And so as your people... We pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. We, we pray by the one spirit who dwells in all of us. We pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please join us for the hymn. at this time we enter a time of prayer 
And uh, before, we, before I pray, I always like to have a time of, of silent or quiet prayer. Um, and during that time, uh, think of uh, who comes to your heart, who needs prayer. And say a silent prayer for them. Say a quiet prayer for them. Because we know we serve a God who listens to our prayers and responds. So let's start out with a moment of silent prayer. This year feels so different, so new. There are so many in our midst, in our community, in our world that are struggling, struggling with health issues, financial issues, uh, not being able to be in community with their family and their friends. And Lord, this is also the beginning of a, a, a new school year with so many concerns and apprehensions. Family, students, teachers, administrators are all filled with anxieties. They're, difficult decisions to make and some that have already been made. What usually is a season of excitement for new beginnings that we experience at the start of a school year has been replaced by a season of unease that is unsettling. We pray your protection for all of those returning to school and that all will be guided by your Holy Spirit to be in safe, be safe and careful to limit the spread of this virus. We know no matter where we are or where we choose to go, you are always with us. When you feel far away, help us remember you are near. Help us to talk to you when we're feeling sad or fear or even joy. You're just a prayer away. Almighty God, we lift the prayers of this congregation asking you to look upon your people that by your great goodness we may be renewed and preserved both in body and soul. We ask you to look mercifully upon those who are suffering from illnesses, either at home or in the hospital. And we ask that you comfort those who are mourning. We especially lift up and pray for Larry Bowman and his family and the loss of his wife Sharon yesterday. We also pray for the victims and their families of the tragic explosion in Beirut this past week. And we pray that the international community will band together to overcome the serious crisis that they are facing. Continue teaching us the truth of your love. You have given us your son that we might understand the extent of your caring, the price you will pay, the cost you have already borne for the sake of the family, for the sake of creation. Keep close to us, trusting in your love, in your understanding, in your forgiveness, in all your provision. And we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. I know a lot of people are agonizing because we as the church can't meet together because of this uh, pandemic. But I do want to let you know because we can't meet together, this church has not been put on hold. The ministry of Jesus Christ continues on uh, now more than ever. For we reach out, especially this church, reaches out to those who are struggling, who are suffering, who need food, uh, who uh, need help, and who... Um, in, in these troubling times that we need to the we need to hear God's power that power that Jane talked about not the power and authority but that subtle love of God love of Christ that um, uh, will help people and make a difference in people's lives 
It's that power that can light up the universe, fire up the stars, power the planets, move the oceans, and give life to every creature on earth. And that incredible truth is that that power and that mercy and that comfort is available to all of us, but not everyone knows this power and glory. So we need the support of the church to make sure that message is spread, that our work here on earth continues to the ministry of Jesus Christ. So we give our time, our prayer, our talents, and our witness and our resources for helping to bring the talent, kingdom of God here on earth. Uh, we know that many of you out there are struggling, but if you feel led to give this morning, there's a, a link that's going to be up in the chat room, or you can mail a check to St. Andrews. And we want to thank you for your unwavering faith and willingness to support this church to make a difference for Jesus Christ. I hope that you will sing along to the Lord's Prayer as we sing it today. I know that a lot of you know it, so sing along at home. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Forgiving, Lord, the first offering you ask is the giving of ourself, loving you and others boldly, and refusing to let our fear of the storms around us to keep us from taking risk. Forgive us for the times when you've called us to leave the places of comfort in our lives and we've ignored your call. Forgive us when our giving has not grown beyond a zone of safety, but you blessed our gifts in each of us at any rate. And for those times when we dared to put our foot outside the boat and then began to sink up to our knees, 
Thank you for not taking your hand away. For all this and so much more, we give thanks in your holy name, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please, please join us for the closing hymn. <laughs> benediction if you are home with somebody and you want to take their hand that's okay um, if not just receive this benediction now go forth into this day as the people of God finding your identity finding who you are in the face of Christ and trusting him to help you carry out that call go forth into this day knowing you are loved in Jesus precious name Amen. Have a great Sunday. Sorry.